Our last lecture really looked more at how we created customer value and engagement and sort of an overview of the marketing principles in a big general environment. This chapter is going to look more at a company level and it's going to look more about how we build this customer engagement and more about how a company begins to make decisions on their marketing processes. Companies must make some sort of a game plan in order to prosper and to grow. They need to make these plans based on the given situations they're in, opportunities they may see, the objectives of what they want to do, and more importantly, the resources that they are able to muster. Now, this is called basically strategic planning. It's basically the process of developing and maintaining a strategic fit between the organization's goals, its capacities, and the changing market opportunities around it. Now, strategic planning is basically the stage that's set for all business planning. Now, companies will generally prepare an annual plan, some long range plans, those are five or more years, and they'll have strategic plans. Now, annual plans and long range plans tend to deal with the company's current business. Now, how are they going to keep it going? What are they going to do today, tomorrow? In contrast, though, the strategic plans involve adapting the firm to take advantage of opportunities in the environment, opportunities they see in the marketplace. For this course, we're going to take a quick look at strategic planning through this lecture, but you'll go into greater depth in other business classes. So this quick overview of how strategic planning and marketing are linked is important for you to move forward, not just with marketing, but understanding the whole business process. Now, I did state that marketing is in every organization, so is strategic planning. And it doesn't matter if that organization is for profit or not for profit. So as an example, PETA has a strategic plan. And I'm going to try to read this word from word from their website. Experience has taught us, PETA, that provocative and controversial campaigns make a difference between allowing important, yes, depressing subjects to remain visible and exposing them to the public versus remaining invisible. So basically they have got a plan. They want these subjects to be seen and they've planned that they're going to do something that's controversial, something that gets attention because if they don't, these depressing subjects could be hidden. And their point is, their plan is, their strategic plan is to make sure that these subjects don't remain hidden. So company-wide strategic planning guides, marketing strategies, and it also basically guides the planning within different departments. Like marketing strategies, the broader company strategy must be customer focused. So let's take a look at this figure. What this is doing is it's illustrating the steps in strategic planning. At the corporate level, the company starts with strategic planning process by defining its overall purpose, its mission. The mission turns into detailed, supportive objectives that guide the entire company. Then the headquarters decides what portfolio of businesses and products is best for the company and how we're going to support each one. Now, in turn, each business and product develops detailed marketing plans that support the company's overall or company-wide plan. Thus, marketing planning occurs at the business unit level, the product level, and the market level. It supports a company's strategic plans with more detailed plans for specific marketing opportunities. There are four parts to most strategic plans for an organization. It starts with a vision of the company. The vision statement is generally a short written statement, a few sentences at most. That is a picture of what your company will look like in the future. This is a way in which the hopes and dreams of the business are sort of expressed. Let's take a look at Disney's 19, uh, 2019 vision statement. It says to be one of the world's leading producers and providers of entertainment and information. The vision statement shows leadership targets for strategic management and provides an overview of the nature of the business. This corporate vision statement first factor is specific to the company's market scope, which in this case is global. 
On the other hand, the second factor is about leadership. Thus, the vision, the vision statement shows that the Walt Disney World Company focuses on becoming the top player in the global market for amusement parks, entertainment, and mass media products. Attaining this goal requires effective management. And finally, to address the level of competition out there, Disney will need to strategically develop competitive products that suit the new trends in the industry. So the second thing that's there is a mission statement. Now, a mission statement is generally a sentence or a short paragraph, just like the vision. However, it defines the existence of the business, the, the nonprofit organization. Even individuals will have mission statements. This mission statement articulates the company's purpose, both for those who are within the organization and for the general public. This is basically what the organization wants to accomplish in the larger environment. Now, mission statements are generally created by asking questions such as, what is our business? Who is our consumer? What do consumers value? And mission statements are constantly being revised, looked at, and updated as the environment changes. Now, successful companies continue to raise these questions and answer them carefully and completely. This means that mission statements should be market-oriented and defined in terms of basically satisfying customer needs. Moreover, mission statements should be meaningful and yet specific and also moving to a point. They should emphasize the company's strengths and tell how it intends to win basically in the marketplace. Now, the company's mission statement is focused on customers and the customer's experience it is seeking to create. Remember that mission statement is not a business plan. Nope, a business plan explains how it will win or how it will produce a profit. You'll learn a lot more about that in entrepreneur class. A mission statement though, defines the motivation for the business for turning a profit in the first place. We stated earlier on that mission statements are for not just corporations, but individuals and nonprofit organizations. In this case, let's take a look at a mission statement from the Internal Revenue Service. Yep, the IRS has a mission statement. It says to provide America's taxpayers top quality services by helping them understand and meet their tax responsibilities and enforcement of the law with integrity and fairness to all. Now, I'm certain we could argue on whether or not they meet that mission, but that is what is set out as the mission for the IRS and what they're supposed to be trying to achieve. Disney is sort of the company we're looking at. We looked at their vision statement. Let's take a look at their mission statement. The first factor in Disney's corporate mission statement refers to the types of outputs that the company offers to its target customers. For example, content, services, and consumer products are the broadest classifications that represent the conglomerate's offerings. This factor includes the product mix in Disney's four P's. Remember that's product, place, promotion, and price. The product classification determines the divisions and the subsidies, as an example, Pixar, that are included in Disney's corporate structure. The second factor of this mission statement is a series of adjectives that describes the company's products in being the most creative and innovative and profitable and premier. The company implies leadership through its products. Moreover, the company targets the global market for its products based on the third factor in the corporate mission. In considering these factors of the corporate mission, the Walt Disney Company has a generic competitive strategy. It's an intensive growth strategy. It must include innovation, creativity, or other basically strategic management efforts. These factors are strongly associated with the corresponding vision statement, and it has a huge impact on the direction of the company and what it should do. 
Mission statements are good, but they tend to be rather broad. And they will help us, though, lead to a hierarchy of objectives, including business objectives and marketing objectives, maybe even financial objectives. Marketing strategies and programs must be developed to support these marketing objectives. As such, a company needs to turn its mission into detailed supporting objectives for each level of management. Each manager should have an objective and be responsible for reaching them. The question, what do you want to accomplish with our marketing strategy, may seem silly at first. Of course, you want people to buy your product. However, this is too broad for a business to determine the best way to go about it. Instead, more specific objectives need to be determined, such as perhaps increasing product awareness, reducing customers' resistance to the product, maybe even entering merging markets. These objectives need to be what we call SMART objectives, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-specific or time-bound. Our marketing strategy contains the company's value propositions. It has key branding messages, data on target customers, demographics, and demographics are things like your age, how much income you make, where you live. They also have some other what we call high level elements that we'd want to know. Now, marketing strategies ideally have a far longer lifespan than the perhaps individual marketing plan for a product because the marketing strategy contains key elements of the company's brand. In other words, marketing strategies cover the big picture message, while marketing plans discuss the details of specific campaigns. Now, marketing plan, that's a document that details specific types of marketing activities that the company is going to conduct and contains timetables for rolling out those various marketing initiatives. Widely known as the father of management, Peter Drucker formulated many of the concepts about business that we now take for granted. As you see, he focuses very much on understanding the consumer. And that's why we keep saying that all of the strategic work that we're going to do needs to be based on consumer needs and the expectations we want them to have of our products. You'll also notice the lecture code is here. This would be the same one that you saw in the last lecture. A business portfolio is a collection of businesses and products that make up a company. The best business portfolios is ones that basically best fit the company's strengths. Here you see an example of Disney's business portfolio, and that's not even everything, but this is a large number of their items. You'll notice that there are things like Pixar and Marvel, but there's also Disneyland resorts in Shanghai. There's consumer products, there's a cruise line. When we start talking about this many companies though, one of the major activities then in strategic planning for a company is basically a business portfolio analysis. Now, this is a process in which management evaluates the products and businesses that make up the entire company. Business portfolio planning involves two steps. First, the company must analyze its current business portfolio and determine which businesses should receive more, less, or basically no investment. Second, it must shape the future portfolio by developing strategies for growth and also downsizing. Now, there are two steps for an analyzing a portfolio. Management must first step into identifying the key businesses that make up the, the company. These are called strategic business units or SBU. An SBU can be a company division, a product line within a division, or maybe even a simple product or brand. So if we look at Disney, something like Phineas and Ferb would be a single product or brand. A business unit would be more like the consumer products. Or a division may be more like Disneyland Resorts. A company's next assesses the attractiveness of these various SBUs and decides how much support that each one basically deserves. 
Now, the purpose of strategic planning is to find ways in which the company can best use its strengths and take advantage of attractive opportunities in the environment. For this reason, most standard por portfolio analysis methods evaluate the SBUs on two important dimensions. First is the attractiveness of the SBU in the market or the industry. And the second is the strength of the SBU's position in that market or industry. So how attractive is it? And what is the position? How strong is it? Over the course of your studies, you'll learn about several different methods. In this particular chapter, we'll, care, we'll be covering two methods. The best known portfolio planning and analysis method was developed by the Boston Consulting Group, a leading management consulting firm, and it's called the BCG Matrix. This is a planning tool that uses graphic representation of a company's products and services in an effort to help that company decide you know, what it should keep, sell, or invest more money in. Basically, this tool is used internally by management to assess the current state of the value of a firm's units or its product lines. This matrix shows the classification of a company's SBUs. Market growth rates provide a measurement of the market attractiveness. Relative market share serves as a measure of the company's strengths in the market. Now, as you can see, there are four types of um, areas in this. Let's start with stars. Products that are high in growth markets and make up a sizable portion of that market are considered to be stars. They should be invested in more. You can see the stars in the upper left quadrant of this particular diagram. Now, this means that it generates high income, but it also consumes a large amount of the company's cash. If a star can remain a market leader, it eventually will become what's called a cash cow, which we really like. For Disney, theme parks currently are stars. Parks earn a really high profit, but at the same point, they have to put a lot of money into these parks. A cash cow, it produces what are you might say low growth areas, but the company has such a relatively large market share already that they don't really need a whole lot of growth. The company should thus milk the cash cow for as long as it can. Generally, these products generate return that are higher than market growth rates and sustain itself from the cash flow perspective. These products should be taken advantage for as long as possible. In effect, the low growth but high share cash cow should be basically used as a way to generate cash to be reinvested in the high growth, high share stars, which are basically the future. For Disney, consumer products are their cash cow. There is an increase in sales each year, but there's really no addition to the features, the operations of offering what they offer to the consumer. There are t-shirts and mugs and sheets, and there really is no more new products. All they're doing is changing what's on the products with some new faces. So instead of Mulan, they'll be Belle. And instead of Belle shirts, they'll be whoever the next Disney star is, Frozen. So they keep breaking in money with these because they're not doing more things. They can use the money they get from that to help grow the stars, so to grow more theme parks. Now, question marks are opportunities where there's some high growth rate markets, but which the company does not really maintain a large market share. They typically grow fast, but they consume a large amount of the company's resources. The products in these quadrants should be analyzed frequently and closely to see if they're still worth maintaining. So for Disney, there's a big question about ESPN. When they first picked up ESPN, there was a really fast growth rate. But over the years, that growth rate has been going down and down. So the question is, is, is this really something worthy of them to maintain? Or should they perhaps start looking at diversifying this particular item? Now, dogs, well, let's hope a company doesn't have too many of them, but they're, they're usually there somewhere. If a company has a product that's low in market share, means that not many people are buying it, and it's a low rate of growth, it's considered to be a dog, and it should be sold or liquidated or 
maybe even repositioned. Dogs don't generate much cash for the company, and since they have low market share, there's really very little potential for it to grow. Because of this, dogs can turn out to be what we call cash traps, tying up the company's funds for long periods of time. For this reason, they are prime candidates for basically getting rid of. For Disney, interactive media, like internet games, have not been profitable for Disney. They either need to revamp them or they need to shut them down. Now, I do want you to understand there are limitations to the BCG approach. It can be difficult, time consuming, and basically costly to implement. Management may find it hard to difficult to define what the actual business unit is. What is its marketable measure share? What is the growth rate? Moreover, the matrix is not a prediction tool. It takes into account neither new or disruptive products that are entering the market, nor does it look at the rapid shift in consumer demand. As a result, strategic planning is often done by divisional managers who are closer to their markets. Thus, a company can use a decentralized strategic planning strategy. You've seen these BCG matrices not just used in the overall company, but quite often they may even be used within these sub companies to decentralize and then they may pull everything together. It's a wonderful tool, but we have to remember not one thing is going to really let us understand everything. The product market expansion grid refers to a portfolio planning tool for identifying companies growth opportunities through market penetration, market development, product development, or diversification. The first thing companies have to do is consider whether they can actually achieve what we call a deeper market penetration. That is, can the company make more sales to its current customers without changing their original product? Looking at Disney, this is not one of their primary strategies, but the company has already expanded to their current products, to their current customers through a wide variety of different marketplaces. For Disney to use this strategy, they would have to increase sales of existing products to current customers. A little while ago, you could see they used this strategy when they opened Disney stores. It started to help them increase sales of their current products, perhaps to individuals that had no other way to reach them. However, now with Amazon, they've also teamed with them. And so many of their Disney stores are beginning to close because people can get to their products now through Amazon. Both of those would be market penetration strategies. They're simply looking for new ways to sell their current products to current customers. Secondly, companies should consider the possibility of market development. Basically here, what we're talking about is identifying and developing new markets for current products. Looking at Disney, this strategy is, again, not one of their primary strategies. This is because this strategy tends to be rather intense. Disney has reached most markets already. They've already done this strategy. However, you can see that Disney does use this strategy in one particular business unit. Disney has used market development when it opens regional amusement parks to capture individuals in those regional markets that are unlikely to attend their major amusement parks. Third, companies should consider product development by offering modified or new products to their current line. This is Disney's primary strategy. It's constantly offering new products all the time to the current existing market. For example, they have new movies coming out. These tend to be consumed by the current market and the company produces new products, t-shirts, dolls, toys, based on those movies. We're not really talking about bringing new people in. These are already people who like Disney, who like Disney films. It's just the newest and latest film. Finally, companies may want to consider diversification, which refers to starting up or buying businesses beyond the firm's current products and markets. Disney has and often uses diversification as a type of strategy. As an example, Disney Plus 
and the Disney Cruise Lines are both examples of diversification. Kind of a review and putting this together. Marketing strategy involves two key questions. Which customers will we serve? We do this through segmentation and targeting. How will we create value for them? How do we differentiate or position ourselves? Then the company has to design a marketing program. So those are the four P's, product, place, promotion, and price. All of this is intended to deliver the value to our target customers. At the core, marketing is all about creating customer value and profitable customer relations. Let's break that chart down a little bit. First, market segmentation refers to dividing a market into distinct groups of buyers who have different needs, characteristics, or behaviors, or who might require separate products or marketing programs. Regional differences in consumer needs in cars is an example. People in the South want air conditioning. People up North may need cars that start to keep their engines warm or from freezing overnight. Market segmentation is a group of consumers who respond in similar ways to a given set of marketing efforts. In the car market, for example, consumers who want bigger, more comfortable cars, regardless of price, make up one market segmentation. Consumers who are mainly about price and the operating economy make up another segmentation. Market targeting involves evaluating each market segment's attractiveness and selecting one or more segments to enter. A company should target segments in which it can be profitable, generate the greatest customer value, and be sustainable over time. A car company looking at first-time car buyers might look at 18-year-olds, you know, high schoolers or people just entering college, versus 24-year-olds who are just out of college or a few years into their jobs. One is going to be probably much more sustainable and profitable than the other. After a company has decided which market segment to enter, it must determine how to differentiate itself in the marketing offerings for each target segment and what position it wants to occupy in those segments. Positioning is arranging for that product to occupy a clear, distinctive, and desirable place relative to basically its competition and the minds of the target customer. Marketing tries to create an image or an identity in the mind of the target market for their brand or their organization. As an example, the Kia Soul uses advertising and a lot of technology that becomes standard that young consumers use. It also has a lower entry price. So it, in its own way, has positioned itself to be a car for young high-tech people. And young high-tech people tend to see that as their car. Seniors aren't really looking at this as being their type of car. It has too many bells and whistles, you might want to say. Effective positioning begins with differentiation. This refers to actually differentiating the market offerings to create superior customer value. Once a company has chosen a desirable position, it must take strong steps to deliver and communicate that position to the target customer. The company's entire marketing program should support their chosen position strategy. We're going to cover a lot more about positioning as we move through this course. It is key to your ability to successfully compete against your competition. Some critics have stated that the four P's may omit or even you know, sort of underemphasize certain important activities. As an example, many people in marketing believe that packaging should be included in the four P's as it is considered one of the many product decisions. However, services like banking, airlines, and hairdresser services also fall underneath the category of products. These are known as service products, but often the four P's don't always fit them as well. The main criticism is that the four P's emphasize only the seller's viewpoint. Hence, to cater to the buyer's viewpoint in this age of customer value and relationship, 
the four P's might be better described as the four A's, and these ex include acceptability, affordability, accessibility, and awareness. Managing the marketing process requires the four marketing management functions, as illustrated in this figure. They include analysis, planning, implementation, and control. The company first develops many company-wide strategies and then transfers them into the marketing and other plans for each division, product, or brand. Through implementation, the company turns the plans into actions. Control consists of measurement and evaluating the results of the marketing activities and taking any corrective actions where needed. Finally, market analysis provides the information and evaluation needed for all the other marketing activities. This is a circular design because basically it never ends as the marketplace is always changing. A SWOT analysis, which represents strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats, is a framework used to evaluate a company's competitive position and to develop strategic plans. A SWOT analysis assesses internal and external factors, as well as current and future potentials. Now, strengths describe what an organization excels at and what separates it from the competition. A strong brand, perhaps, loyal customer base, a strong balance sheet, some sort of unique technology. There are all types of things that can be a strength. Weaknesses stop an organization from performing at its optimal level. They are areas where the business needs to improve to remain competitive. Sort of the opposite of what we just heard. Maybe we have a weak brand, higher than average turnover rates, high levels of debt, an inadequate supply chain, or maybe even a lack of capital. Opportunities are external. Opportunities refer to a favorable external factor that could give an organization a competitive advantage. For example, if a country cuts off its tariffs, a car manufacturer can export its cars perhaps to this new market, increasing sales and market share. A threat is also referred to as a factor that is external, but it could have potential harm to the organization. For example, a drought is a threat to wheat producing companies as it may destroy or reduce yield crops. Another common threats include things such as rising costs of materials, increased competition, tight label supply, and other items like that. Now, SWOT analysis is designed to facilitate a realistic, fact-based, data-driven look at the strengths and weaknesses of an organization, its initiatives, or even at an industry as a whole. Organizations need to keep this analysis accurate by avoiding preconceived beliefs, or what we like to say, gray areas. Instead, they should focus on real life contact. Companies should use it to be a guide, not necessarily as a prescription. So we can look at the Disney SWOT analysis that has been done, and we can see here that we talk about some of their strengths as being brand reputation, diversified business, some of their weaknesses is the change in viewership trends, a decline in going to the cinema. Opportunities, things that are outside of them. That's the chance to grow in emerging markets. As emerging markets become more profitable, so what we're talking about is in countries that were perhaps were poorer, but they've become a little bit more wealthy, they now have an opportunity to begin to perhaps sell products or their goods or services in those areas. And then a threat would be a loss of revenue due to piracy. People pirate movies all the time. And while at first it may not seem like a big deal if one or two people pirate movies, but when you start having global organizations create pirated movies, then you lose the opportunity to make a lot of money. One of the things that Disney has done because of piracy is that they now have worldwide release dates. In the past, things may have only been released in the United States first or the United States and a few other countries first, but that gave an opportunity for the pirates to come in, make copies of the movies, and then start selling them in these countries where there was not a release date. So now instead, if they release the movie worldwide on the same day, then there's going to be less opportunity for piracy. 
Now, a SWOT analysis is a great way to guide business strategy meetings. It's powerful to have everyone sit in the room and discuss the company's core strengths and weaknesses, and then they can move on to define the opportunities and threats. And then finally, just sit around and start to begin to brainstorm the different ideas. Now, what you also see are two different ways to look at how the SWOT analysis is laid out. The Walt Disney one is probably the more common way that you'll see a SWOT analysis laid out. But I've also begun to see more and more people using the one on the left because it helps us understand these internal and external factors in the way that they play out. This is the end of the current lecture for chapter two. Uh, hopefully I have reached many of you with th this information. Again, I do wanna say that this is more of an overview of these topics because as you move through your business program, you're going to get deeper and deeper into them. So those of you who've already had a few business classes, it's a nice little summary. For those of you who have not had many business classes, this is sort of an introduction. We're gonna be getting more into the four Ps in the next few sessions.